Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Josh Burks. I am the Economic Health and Redevelopment Director for the City of Fort Collins. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. Um, I want to thank you for coming out tonight. Um, this is kind of a new format that we're trying out um, at the city and in my office, the Economic Health Office. Uh, we're calling it an Ask Me Anything. It's really meant to be uh, fairly light in terms of our presentation to you folks and more of a chance for questions of us and, an, uh, and then an opportunity for us to, um, to answer those questions. So uh, that'll be our format tonight. If it, we'd appreciate your feedback on it since it's new. So if you've got thoughts at the end, uh, either grab myself or grab Emily who will be wandering around with the, the mic later um, when we ask it to the question portion and just kind of give us your thoughts. So we'd appreciate that. Um, there are snacks, so please help yourself, as well as we have a sign-in sheet, so that's, um, we'd encourage you to sign that in just so we know uh, who all's been here and uh, can follow up with you if need be afterwards. All right, so um, as I said, I'm the, the director for the Economic Health and Redevelopment Office, and uh, my office played a big role in helping to negotiate the uh, public financing for this uh, project, as well as to help um, oversee this project as it went through construction. Um, so that's been our role, and I'm, what I'm going to do now is ask each of these individuals who are um, some city employees, we have a representative from the developer here, um, and a con uh, consultant of ours to introduce themselves and maybe give us just a quick highlight of what their role was in the project, and then we'll j jump into your questions. Thank you, Josh. I'm Eric Kessberg. I'm the uh, Code Compliance Supervisor for the City of Fort Collins, and my role with the mall development uh, was uh, focused around construction noise and hours of operation for what we allowed them to do with their um, pours and, and otherwise. Thanks, Eric. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tom Leeson. Um, I am currently the Community Development and Neighborhood Services Director. Um, so I oversee the planning department that um, did all the uh, um, development review for the project. At the time of construction, I was in a different role with the city. I was the redevelopment manager working for Josh um, and was kind of the project manager um, for the redevelopment phase of it from the city's perspective um, during construction. Thank you, Tom. Keith Meyer uh, with Ditesco. I'm a consultant that worked for the city, um, working at the time directly with Tom and Josh. Uh, my role on the project was overseeing the construction and compliance with the redevelopment agreement, working directly with the developer. Thanks, Keith. My name is John Gaffney. I'm a senior asset manager with Alberta Development Partners, and uh, I've been a part of the project since it kicked off, uh, since we acquired the center in uh, July of 2012. Uh, my responsibilities have basically been to oversee the operations of the center as it's gone through development, and now I, uh, I oversee what's now a finished product, basically, from a construction standpoint, and I oversee all the day-to-day -day operations that go on out here at Foothills. So thanks for coming tonight. Okay, so that's a quick overview of who we've got up here tonight. You guys can um, ask us questions. So um, again, we don't, we're not intending to provide a whole lot more presentation and just now have a chance uh, to answer any questions you guys might have. Um, if you don't have questions, I have a few for them. So um, anybody have a question they'd like to ask before, we, before I hit them with a couple of my prepared questions? Should I get them started with one and you guys can keep thinking? Oh, there we go, sorry. I'm sort of afraid to ask this, but in light of what you read about retail nowadays, of course that didn't occur I don't think in 2012, but you read about how hard it is for all the retail out, you know, stores. And, and so how do you think this, is gonna, this problem is going to impact this mall coming along at this time? Okay, so uh, the question is kind of around um, what are we reading in the papers right now about the retail industry, maybe the influence of um, online and e-commerce, and what will that mean for the mall? So John, I'll let, I'll let you start off by answering that one. Sure, that's a great question. Um, certainly the environment has changed in retail, uh, even in the last five years since we took this project on. Um, I would say that we were a bit of, we had some foresight on that, and we, we kind of saw this coming down the road, so I think in a nutshell, what we've tried to do is create a, a sense of place here, and you see we're very heavy on some entertainment options. The Cinemark does amazing business. Uh, you know, we've got a, a free concert series we do out here all summer long. Hopefully some of you got a chance to enjoy that. 
uh, a lot of the restaurants are draws. It's more of a kind of getting people here around a, almost an entertainment kind of zone and, a, and a creating a sense of place type of thing. The ice rink we built out here, we had 12,000 people skate on it in just about six weeks last, uh, last winter. So we see the direction it's going, but we know that retail's always going to be viable in, in a brick and mortar setting. Um, that's been played out by some of our tenants that perform very well. Um, at this point, it's really a, a, a challenge of finding the right mix of tenants. Um, I mean, I, we've clearly got some challenges. Our, our junior anchor we had, we had a lease with Sports Authority obviously went bankrupt, you know, midway through our redevelopment. So um, we've got a couple other stores. Jimboree, for example, is, is going through a bankruptcy. Payless, you know, we know Payless is probably sticking around. Uh, Jimboree, we know, is going to be moving out at some point. Um, so there's some very real uh, issues in the world of retail, but we feel like we're we're staying ahead of it. We're, we're looking for the right mix. It's a reason you see still some vacancy. We're probably 30, 30 plus percent still vacant right now. That's because we're trying to find long-term viable tenants that we know are going to survive and, and that are going to serve the Fort Collins community well. So it's always a concern. Um, it's a changing world in this kind of mall uh, uh, world that we're in right now. But we, we really believe it's viable. And I think that's playing itself out when you see um, you know, some of the visitors uh, visiting our restaurants and some of the entertainment options out here, which then drives uh, things uh, on the retail side of it. So it's a great question. Thank you. What's the health of Macy's? <clears throat> That's a good question. Uh, we, I think if you follow the news, you know that uh, earlier this year in January, they closed, what, about 111 stores throughout the country. Um, they kept Foothills open, which is a very encouraging sign for us. You know, it's our, our major anchor here. Uh, Macy's is an unusual position in our, in our center. They actually own their pad that they sit on in a part of their parking lot. So they're almost uh, not like a lot of the other tenants. All the, almost all the tenants in the mall report to us their sales on a monthly basis, so we have a very good idea of how they're doing. Macy's doesn't fall into that category, so I can't really get into the numbers. Um, I think that in their portfolio and in this region, this is performing well, and I think that's probably borne out by the fact that they left this, this one open. Um, and we certainly think with the residential infill and leasing up the rest of the center that it will continue to help them and, and continue to uh, grow their sales, you know, from the low point that they obviously hit during our, our development. So, Are you going to have a coffee shop around here? We're going to live in the co-op, <laughs> several of us are, and I want to know if there's going to be a coffee shop with all the cycle apartments and everything. Well, would you like to open a coffee shop? Is uh, yeah, no. Me? No. Uh, no, we are absolutely engaged with several coffee operators. We've had a couple deals that have fallen through for various reasons. It's um, You can actually go buy a coffee at, from the Starbucks in, uh, in Cinemark right now, just as an FYI. Um, I think Annie Ann's is selling coffee. Some of our other restaurants have kind of teed that up and, and uh, taken advantage of that. But yes, we're looking to bring a coffee kiosk into the center court area, as well as something uh, on the exterior of the center. Could you address the um, residential infill that you're speaking of, too? What, how many apartments or condos or homes? Sure, and Josh, there? feel free to jump in if you want to address yeah, any we'll of this. But um, I'll tell you, just as a quick update, we, uh, we sold that land to McWinney, who I'm sure you've all are, are aware, they did uh, you know, the shops down at Sentara. Great company, great partnership we've got with them. Um, they are bringing the first 70 plus units online here the first week of November. And they may even start moving some people in uh, a couple weeks early uh, prior to that. So that's, that's happening right now and they'll be wrapping that up. I'll kind of let Josh uh, give you a, a little bit more in depth on that. Yeah, so I think the total count on unit is just over 400 units um, of market rate apartments. Um, as John said, they're coming on in phases. Um, all the phases are under construction right now, so they should be, um, you know, by, by this time next year, they should be fully open and, and occupied, um, if not sooner. Um, again, I haven't been in touch with the residential developer on exactly their schedule, but it does sound like they're bringing units on right away. Um, you know, and that, um, when we started the project, we had um, a plan that had as many as 800 units, um, but we ended up landing in on this 400 unit um, project because that was what fit the market um, that we have now and uh, also fit the space, so. What is the breakdown gonna be on those apartments in so far as bedrooms and then also whether, uh, and you're going to the, uh, 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 subsidized people or this sort of thing? 
Yeah, um, I can answer the second question, which dealt, which was about subsidized units, um, but I, I'm not off the top of my head aware of exactly their, um, the mix between units. I think they have... Um, yeah, Josh, do, if you want to jump in, they're, yeah. they're doing uh, lofts starting right around 600 square feet up to two bedrooms, uh, and the rents are high-end, frankly, for the market. It's, it's a high-end product they're offering. Rents on the loft start around eleven or twelve hundred dollars a month. Um, the two hundred, uh, the two bedrooms are, are uh, topping out around twenty one hundred and change a month. So, it's high end for the market for rental. Right, and the, as it relates to the subsidized units, the city doesn't have a requirement that residential development, um, multifamily, um, has to build subsidized units, and so there are no units right now within um, the project that are planned to be subsidized. Other questions, or shall I jump in here? Okay, we've got one over here, Emily, or one in the middle. Why don't I start with you and go with Start here, and yeah, we'll come I'll to you next. Over there. I was just wondering if, if there's any concern about all the traffic that is going to be generated on two-lane Stanford from all those apartments. Tom, do you want to handle that one? Well, certainly traffic is something that we look at closely through the development review process. Um, and um, the project as a whole was reviewed um, holistically um, initially. So we, we initially reviewed the project as the mall and, and w as well as the residential rather than looking at individual components. And the project itself had to make a fair amount of um, traffic improvements, including offsite improvements along Horsetooth um, as well to uh, try to address some of those um, traffic concerns. But they were required to do a full-blown traffic analysis, um, a traffic kickback study, um, and also provide some fees in order to make some improvements, um, uh, over, over street oversizing fees to uh, address some of the impacts throughout the region. So um, we feel like um, they did a good job in terms of addressing those impacts. There will be additional traffic, um, but the infrastructure that's in place is, is in place to handle that amount of traffic. Thank you. Are there any other uh, entrances going to be put on Stanford as far as for the, for the apartments? No. Um, okay. All of the entrances that you see are, are kind of fixed, and that's going to be at, um, I think there are, what, two entrance points off of Stanford? Um, so two into the residential, and then one off the center. So yeah, those are the, the, there won't be any additional entrance. Oh, okay. And how many? Uh, garages are there in the apartments now? Um, you know, I don't know off the top of my head the number, the, the count, um, so I'm not, I'm not really sure. I don't think they fully parked, you know, they have uh, uh, surface parking and they have some garage parking, but I don't think it was enough to, for all of the parking requirements. In this, I live over on Stanford, but I noticed on the far end where they're building that big complex, and they have the water area that stores the water going. It seemed like when it rained, it was really bogged down with a lot of water. Good eye. <laughs> Thank you for noticing that. We did too. <laughs> it's a big deal. And I'll first start by saying, you know, one of the big things of this project in our mind and that we worked with the city on is there, were, there was zero water treatment. Storm water, there was nothing. Everything, it rained, it snowed, it melted, it went right into the city system without being treated, filtered, this type of thing. So we've added a, an immense amount of, of great modern up-to-date treatment for that. And those detention ponds are designed to do that, hold the water, filter it before it gets into the city uh, sewer system. So basically what happened with that is we had a fault in one of the drains. And uh, we had our, our general contractor come back out with our excavation company, and that's been resolved. We're working on replanting and remulching it. So good eye catching that and it was a big deal for us especially in the summer months you don't want you know mosquitoes and the, these types of things so keep your eye on it it should be solved here uh, today uh, we, we got the report that everything's been jetted out and clean so th thanks for your patience on that one <laughs> and Josh you're gonna write down questions that we need to get back to people on okay so Uh, have you looked and feel that there's enough grocery shopping, particularly for when all these apartments get filled out right here in the immediate area within walking distance? 
That's a, that's a great question. Um, I guess I'll start with this, and I don't know if you want to add anything, John, you can from the, from the developer's perspective. Um, yeah, I think that's something we're mindful of. We do have uh, nearby, I think the nearest grocery store, well, we have one probably equidistance to King Super south of here, as well as the Albertsons now Safeway at Horsetooth and, um, and College, um, and they serve a pretty large area. So I'd imagine that those will be the primary two shopping locations for um, these residents, as well as we have Trader Joe's over in the, the Square Center, which is right there by Sierra Trading Post. So um, my perspective would be that the market probably has sufficient grocery store. Um, anything you want to add from a tenanting perspective? Well, I... Certainly, I wouldn't think that we would have anything on the scope of a large grocery store, although I do know we're talking to a couple of uses that could be more of a, in a 10,000 square foot, more of a convenience type thing or a smaller type thing where a resident can come grab basic groceries. I, I don't know if it's appropriate to bring it up, but I, I've heard a lot of talk about the Kmart uh, spot being redeveloped, the Cronky group that bought that. I, I believe the plan, Josh, is a, is a large King Supers at this point or... Yeah, we've had, um, and Tom, if you want to add anything here, so um, Kroger actually bought the uh, former Kmart site a while back, um, several years ago now, um, and when Kmart closed down, the, 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 the plan at least that we've been um, working with King Supers on is for that site to be redeveloped for uh, a marketplace concept that they did up, similar to what they did up on North College if you've been up there. Um, so that would bring more grocery kind of into the broader area as well. Other questions? Um, maybe I'll throw one out here. Uh, and maybe this is one we can all answer. So uh, what do you think, what do you, think um, you know, really, really works well at the site and has worked well throughout the project? Um, I don't know, Tom, maybe you've, you've got a mic in your hand. You want to get us started? Um, well, I would just say one of the, certainly one of the successes, as John indicated, you know, um, for those of you that remember the old mall, um, it was very uh, blighted, um, infrastructure was aging, um, and there was, no, um, uh, there was really no vitality to it. So I think one of the greatest successes is the, um, the updating of the infrastructure. Certainly stormwater, um, from the city's perspective, that's a huge plus uh, in terms of being able to treat all that water. If you imagine all of the parking area and all that water just kind of sheet um, flowing off into the system um, was a, a tremendous improvement. Um, in addition to that, I think all of the uh, pedestrian connections and pedestrian improvements that we've seen have, have also been a tremendous success in terms of, of, of completing the infrastructure system uh, in the area. The sidewalks along college, the underpass, even the internal connections were very much lacking in the area. And I think that's a great improvement um, from the city's perspective. So that was one of the greatest, or at least that was one of the biggest goals the city had in terms of the redevelopment project, was try to get it um, from an infrastructure standpoint updated to sort of to modern, um, modern times, if you will. Keith? So uh, I would say that, my, in my opinion, uh, the, the kind of joint use of the facility and the partnership for the Foothills Activity Center brings a whole other element to a uh, more of a commercial retail shopping center. And I think having that element as part of the project is, is uh, very unique. And it, it certainly draws a different crowd and will be used by not only the folks living in the apartments, but uh, potentially even shoppers and people that come here to do um, their, their daily work. So I think having that as a component is, is very unique and very important and has been uh, hugely successful. And I'll just add here, so if, if you're not familiar, the Foothills Activity Center, the site before we began redevelopment had a, a city facility called the Youth Activity Center on it. Um, and that facility was demolished as part of getting the site ready. And so the city made a commitment um, to, to basically rebuild that facility and actually build it back at a higher level of service than we had previously. So the Foothills Activity Center is um, just down the hallway to the right. Um, it's uh, attached here in the building. It's a great modern facility with a full gym, um, a recreational facility, several community facilities. Uh, Councilmember Martinez has an office there, so please stop by anytime you like. If you live in the area, he's your council member, so he's happy to take time to talk with you. Um, Ray's in the audience, so if you wanna say hi to him, you can do that as well later. Um, so, and it provides training classrooms, um, 
the Youth Activity Center had been one of the key facilities for sort of early childhood uh, programming within our recreation program. And uh, in the process of building out Foothills Activity Center, we were able to, to modernize and improve those facilities and, and actually have a number of really great programs. I have a six and a nine year old and they both have been here a number of times and love the facility. So it's a great addition. Thanks for bringing that up, Keith. Uh, John, what would you say? Well, a couple things from uh, from our perspective as a developer, we, we feel like it's taking a little bit longer than we wanted, but we are bringing a mix of experiences, restaurants, shops that weren't here in Fort Collins, uh, you know, five or six years ago, and it's going to continue to get better. We're just shy of 70% open and operating right now. Um, we've got some exciting things that are happening. I, I can tell you, we just... Uh, executed a, a, a binding letter of intent with, uh, with a, a tenant to take over the anchor space that Sports Authority um, abandoned earlier this year. So I can't announce the name yet, but in the coming weeks that'll be out there. Um, we're very excited about that. We've got another tenant um, that we've got a lease out for signature. We expect back any day. It's right along the lines of the size of what H&M will be. Uh, it'll have an exterior entry over on this side of the mall as well as an interior mall. Uh, entry. So the, the leasing is happening. Um, again, it's, we, we've had to weather a few storms and, and be patient, um, but we're going to have some pretty exciting announcements come. So I'd say the mix you know, of, of new amenities, new restaurants, I get great feedback on the, the East Lawn, uh, you know, some of the new tenants we brought in. Again, the Cinemark, if you haven't seen a movie there, is, is fantastic. It's, I, we just saw Dunkirk there a couple weeks ago. It was amazing. Um, and then from a different perspective, I live in Fort Collins. I've lived here for eight years. Um, I didn't just move here for this job, but I got lucky enough to, to latch onto it. Um, your city did a great job uh, with this deal. They really did. They negotiated a, a very, very solid deal for us as citizens. Um, if you look at the study, some of the things that happened around the state, the development down in Longmont at that mall. I mean, I, I wish as a developer we had gotten a, a deal like that, but uh, these guys did, did a, a fantastic job and really held us accountable um, on many levels. Um, everything from deconstructing and diverting waste from the landfill. I think what Keith, we did about 73,000 uh, tons of waste that we diverted uh, and reused in, in a lot of different cool ways. Um, they, they've uh, asked us as part of our redevelopment agreement to do little things like putting free car chargers in, which we have in the garage. You know, um, just, just a lot of, of very uh, engaged uh, city staff was on this project. And, it made me happy. It, it maybe frustrated us sometimes as a developer, but it made me very happy uh, as a citizen of Fort Collins to know that they truly had our, our best interests in heart. So that was, that was great to see. Eric? From a code enforcement perspective, the courtyard behind us where they host the summer uh, concert series has had minimal impact or no impact to the, the surrounding neighborhoods. When we first learned about them, we came out and did noise readings, and we know that they're uh, operating within the city's noise code. So we know that this is a, is a great venue for entertainment that the mall can host with the, you know, the skating rink and the, the summer concert series. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we, we were monitoring to make sure that they were they're good to go. And so far, we've heard no complaints from the surrounding neighbors. So that's good news. Yeah, there's not much more for me to add, which is maybe why I decided to go last. Um, but I, I guess I'll, I'll say that I think one of the things that has worked really, really well is, is the partnership. Um, we had a good private sector partner. Um, as John said, we, the city, tried to be very mindful about um, understanding risk, and, as well as trying to um, ensure that we did get a project that uh, we all as citizens could be proud of, one that would address the kinds of issues that you've heard from public amenities. You know, we have a, a major underpass now that's open that gets uh, pedestrian and bicycle traffic right from the uh, west side of college and uh, over here to the east side of college. And it, you don't have to do that at a, at a lighted crossing anymore. And, um, and it's a great facility, the Foothills Activity Center. So I think, I think what, what we did right in this project was we found a way for um, everybody to get uh, their interests on the table and really put together a project that kind of worked for everyone. Um, and as a result, you know, we see this beautiful facility we're in um, and we are seeing it leasing up. And again, we've got uh, great uh, citizen amenities in the Foothills Activity Center and the underpass as well. Um, other questions from the audience? Sorry, we came in late. But That's we, right. had, we had questions about the apartment complex. Um, I guess we understand, is it 405 units that you're going to have? And the next question is, how many beds does that relate? Does that come out to? 
Yeah, that's a, um, unfortunately, I don't know exactly how many beds. We do know, as John said um, earlier, um, the, the mix is basically studios, which are one bedrooms, up to some two bedroom units. Um, we are taking notes on questions to follow up with. So if you haven't signed in, please do so over at the, the table over here on the side, and we'll send out answers to any questions we weren't able to give tonight to anyone who signed in. So we'll be able to get you that answer, okay? The other question I had was about parking. Is uh -huh. there parking available for these folks? Um, I'll let Tom and John maybe take this question. Yes, um, through the development review process, we do a full analysis of, of um, parking spaces and it's based on bedrooms um, and, and bedrooms in a particular unit. So a two bedroom unit might have a slightly different parking standard than a studio or a one bedroom. Um, so we evaluate that and make sure that they have all of the necessary parking. So um, we, it should be it should be certainly uh, park, have enough parking to accommodate all the residents of the apartments. I don't I don't know the total account uh, number, but it's probably around that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Wondering about this. Uh great garage facility you have here. How long will that be free, or is there any uh, uh, plans for putting a fee on that? No, we have no plans to ever charge for parking out in the parking garage. Get roughly a thousand stalls out there. Um, currently, the fourth floor is not even open because we just don't need it. Um, but as we open it during the holiday season and going forward years in advance, we never foresee charging for parking. I can interject another one here while you guys think. Um, so along the lines of the question I asked a few minutes ago, what we thought worked, I mean, um, what is a lesson that maybe we've, you as an individual have taken from the project, something reflecting now, um, you know, having it open for a while and having the project uh, largely constructed? Um, yeah, just a lesson that you might have taken. John, you've got the mic in your hand, so I'll let you go first. Uh, never trust a schedule uh, that the construction guys tell you. <laughs> I, I say that tongue in cheek. Uh, we had a lot of challenges through the project. Um, you know, a lot of some of them were weather related. Some were things that we simply couldn't con couldn't control. You know, in dealing with some tenants that we were moving out, Sears comes to mind. Um, you know, I think uh, we all went to this with the best intentions and hoped we'd be a little further along than we were. And I will say very candidly, from the developer perspective, uh, perhaps if we had been a bit more conservative on, on some forecasting and and uh, timelines that we put out there, that would, that would have probably been a, a little bit, e made things a little bit easier on, on everybody. So, so sitting next to John, who, you know, I'm the construction guy, so I'm uh, <laughs> taking offense to some of the things he says. No, they, they, you know, from my perspective, I, I think it echoes a little bit what John says, the, the, the learning process around doing what is, this, this project is defined as a public-private partnership, and Learning around and being flexible around elements that develop that relationship, I think, is, is a, a very important thing and something I think the entire team has learned through the delivery of the mall project. And really what that means from a, a very simple standpoint is having understanding of that relationship both contractually and how the, not only the money works, but the, the uh, relationship works relative to all parties being successful through a, rede through, through a $300 million redevelopment of a property. And um, I think that's a strong lessons learned for everybody, um, both the city and the developer alike. And, um, and, it, and this particular model of public-private partnerships is, used, is being used more and more um, to not only redevelop retail properties, but also other public properties. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing, and the market's changing, and people are getting more and more used to having solid relationships around that and taking lessons learned from things like this mall project and applying them to, applying them to the next project. Um, I think I'd say um, one, of the, one of the regrets or one of the lessons learned um, really relates to the architectural style of the buildings along College Avenue. Um, we've heard some issues from people that it feels a little bit too repetitive and a little bit too bland. Um, it was a very difficult um, project to review. I, you know, in a, in a community of this size, um, there's not very often that we review a project of such magnitude. Um, and I think one of the regrets was that perhaps as a city through the development review process, we might have looked at the sort of um, the variety of architectural style of those buildings along College Avenue a little bit closer. 
we were trying, and, and quite honestly, we, we were trying to be cognizant of um, the cost of the project. You, you add architectural standards to a project, it's going to make it more expensive. Um, so that was certainly part of, of the decision. And we don't have architectural standards, quite honestly. We don't, re we don't have architectural requirements in an architectural review board or anything like that. But I think uh, perhaps um, a little bit of closer look at that would have been, would have been uh, a little bit prudent. I will say, however, that the, the landscaping that they have put on a College Avenue is, um, is great. Um, and as all of that landscaping starts to mature, I think we'll probably hear less and less comments about that. Um, as it kind of just softens the, the wall of buildings along College Avenue. One lesson that we learned early on was when we set the parameters around when construction crews can start early morning pours and that kind of stuff is that uh, we let them know they can't start any work or any prep work before that time. When we set the, the 7 o'clock or 6 o'clock a.m. start time, we knew they started showing up. Uh, 45 minutes to an hour before that to stage. So after um, several early mornings from me and some other staff, we, we got the message clear that they're not to have any prep work whatsoever until that variance time allowed. So that was a lesson learned about just setting some stronger parameters around when they could not only start the work but also start staging for the work. Yeah, I'd say, um, I guess my biggest takeaway is that um, just the scale and complexity of a project like this, it's sort of echoing what others have said, you know, schedule uh, ended up changing, um, you know, even, uh, and, and the markets changed. And so I think one of the things that I take away from this is, you know, keeping, um, keeping a focus on achieving the outcomes that are best for the community, but, um, but also being mindful that particularly in real estate, you know, things do change and they can change um, over the course of a project like this. And so how do you build in um, some ability to adjust with those changes while still keeping right the city's best interests in mind as well as you know the developers need to be able to have a, a project that's financially feasible that can be moved forward. So um, so yeah, I think just you know finding places within um, you know partnerships to really treat it as a partnership and look for that flexibility um, to allow for things to be able to change um, because they will is what I've learned. Um, and, you know, being able to, to have some flexibility in there is important. Um, other questions from our audience members? Yes, ma'am. The amenities that are being offered at the uh, new apartments, are, is it just for them or is it open to some of the public? So uh, you're asking specifically about the like, like the, the clubhouse dog, amendment yeah. amenities. And, well, not so much like the swimming pool, but the dog park and there's the uh, internet cafe. Um, let John speak to this. Yeah, I'll confirm this 100 percent, but I'm I'm almost certain that is it is just going to be for the residents. Um, there is one component; they're doing some shared workspace uh, areas. So kind of like you know, Cohere did downtown and some of the other places. Uh, where you can go in and rent space for an office for an hour or a day. I believe that may be open up to the public. I'm not entirely sure, but we'll confirm. If you leave your email, we'll get back to you. Okay. And also, uh, during the winter months, will there be any transportation from the parking garage to the outlying areas? We don't have anything planned at this time, but I could see that coming into play down the line in a couple of years as we get you know, 90 to 100% leased up and operating. It's something that we've, we've studied. I just don't, it, to be candid, it won't happen this year, but it's, it's on the table perhaps in the future. Other questions? Got one in the back. While we wait for that microphone, I do want to mention we are going to start free shuttle service to all the CSU games uh, from the, yeah, starting on uh, the September 9th game. Uh, we'll have two shuttles each way, pre-game and post-game, and they'll pick up right in front of the fountain out here on the East Lawn. So stay tuned for that. We'll get it up uh, this week. We'll have all the details. For and, and the parking will still be free in the garage during that time. Still period, free right, in the John? garage. Okay. This question isn't really directly about the mall, but this side of college looks amazing. Are there any plans to fix the other side of it now? Um, uh, maybe I'll start and then I'll let Tom kind of chime in. Um, a couple of, I think it was a couple of years ago, we've gone through a couple of different planning exercises. Uh, one was the Midtown, uh, Midtown plan and another was, um, what was it called? Uh, the Midtown in Motion plan. 
So the Midtown in Motion plan dealt mostly with uh, pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicular uh, infrastructure and the upgrades that we want to be able to see over time to college, as well as the, mid, uh, the Midtown plan dealt more with land use and, uh, and sort of uh, uh, land use pattern and form. Um, I'll let Tom talk about maybe a little bit on the details of both of those a little more. I will say that um, you know this is this happens to be an area that is a uh, targeted infill and redevelopment area within city plan, which is kind of the big uh, long-term plan. So certainly plans to see things change over time along college. The question will be right uh, pace of that, and really that has to happen along with um, you know the redevelopment um, and investment that the private sector makes in their own property. So, Tom, anything you want to add on the? Um, sure, I'll add that the the Midtown plan that we did um, does sort of raise the level of, of um, improvements for development that occurs, what we call in the Midtown area, which is primarily along College Avenue, uh, in terms of enhanced landscaping, sidewalk connections, um, and just general um, urban design, if you will. So, as projects develop, we anticipate we'll see a more consistent design with what you're talking about on this side of College. I will also add that, um, as you know, this project was developed um, uh, as part of the Urban Renewal Authority and used tax increment financing. And really, one of the um, uh, one of the additional goals of that was to have this project act as a catalyst for other redevelopment projects. And we are starting to see that. Um, we certainly see it with the, the site uh, immediately to the south with Trader Joe's. Um, in that redevelopment, we're seeing some um, activity to the north of it. Um, so as this um, site and as this mall continues to lease up and gets more, continues to get more vital and more activity, we anticipate we'll see continued redevelopment activity, um, certainly in and around the area, and and, and then it will it will redevelop consistent with the Midtown plan. And it's a great question, and I wanted to also put something on your radar. We uh, Foothills, the owners uh, of the property here in conjunction with all the car dealerships, basically from, um, we're talking boardwalk up to about Drake, we are working on something right now, the business improvement district is what it's called. Essentially, it's the landowners uh, on the businesses on the frontage of College Avenue. Um, we've got buy-in uh, enough to get on the ballot uh, here this fall for the election, and should that happen, we're gonna all be contributing money to beautify that, that entire stretch. Now, we, we went into this to try to do it from, I think, Harmony all the way up to Mulberry initially just couldn't get enough buy-in from the business owners. Um, so we shrunk it down. Uh, one of my friends, Luke McFetridge, who's with Newmark, or used to be with Newmark Merrill, who owns the Albertson Safeway Shopping Center across on Horsetooth, he was actually working with us at Alberta for the past year. He's spearheading that, that effort. We, we have uh, pledged our support to it. It just means more dollars out of our pocket via taxes. But the, the idea behind that will be to start with things like beautifying the areas that need it. And our big thing is we want it to all match, you know, and we want this Midtown area and South Midtown to really, really come to life. So that would be a huge component of that um, that we're working on. And you could start to see some movement on that as soon as uh, spring of 2018, if, if, we, if, we, if things go the way we think they will. Other questions? Yep. Uh, John, during the tours, you had mentioned that there might be like the kids play area that um, used to be here that might kind of rove around in the different vacant spots. Is that still a plan? Yes, we're looking at a couple different options. Uh, initially, the, the idea was we were going to do something outdoors, but obviously we're in Colorado, so in the winter we get a ton of phone calls with parents that want to bring the kids. So we are actively looking at, at an area where we can do that. In all likelihood, it would be something in the, the south expansion down here. Um, and, and we're actually looking at possibly even doing something as soon as this holiday season. But long term, we'll have something in. Um, really candidly, with all the construction and moving parts we've had here, it just it presented a lot of challenges. Safety, um, logistically, it wasn't feasible. But uh, when we land where we're going to land, we will have some, a, a component of that for the community, for sure. Good question, Shannon. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, this question really goes to the, the Foothills folks, the guys that are representing the merchants here. And it touches on the fact that neighboring communities have been very aggressive with pledging sales tax to uh, subsidize the development of retail in their communities. And that I'm referring to the Shields store down at the 
Johnstown corner of the intersection down the way. Um, it's always been a uh, part and parcel of promenade shops to automatically rebate a percentage of the sales taxes to the developer who comes in and uh, puts this forward. Now, there's a certain amount of that went on with the redevelopment of the Foothills Mall, but not nearly to the extent that we've seen in other communities. Um, in general, it cannot be argued that this type of activity is good for the economics of our region. We rely on sales tax to provision governmental services in our area, and when one community does it and urges the other community to do it as well, creates a little bit of a sales tax war going on. And so the direct question here to, to the Foothills guys, I mean, do you see this activity as injuring your business interests and the business interests of your clients? And if you do, what, are, what, what can you do about it? Because quite frankly, there are a number of legal solutions to this. What's going on is patently unlawful, and it should be incumbent upon those people who are being injured to do that. I mean, the citizens of Fort Collins are relying on your success in this Foothills Mall to continue to bankroll the services in the community that we uh, rely on. So there's the question. Do, would you mind restating the question? I'm not sure I understand what you're asking me. The, the, the question is, do you see the economic competition that comes from aggressive subsidization of competitors in neighboring communities as, you know, threat might be too strong a word, but certainly a negative vector in the success, success of your enterprise here, the enterprise of every real tailor in this area, et cetera? And if so, you know, would you be willing to consider actions to make sure that everything maintains a level playing field where we're not off subsidizing some shield store. You know, they get three cents on the dollar sales tax down there. Two pennies of that three cents goes directly to the developer who brought in the shields. One goes to the town of Johnstown. They're willing to cannibalize sales tax from our community by virtue of impinging on sales that might otherwise be made in this area. I mean, Let's face it, Foothills Mall is never going to get uh, Cabela's or something else to compete in that market space now that Shields is there. And uh, why not take some aggressive steps to make sure everything stays on a level playing field economically and regionally as far as how we, uh, the mechanisms that we use to fund public government? Okay, in a nutshell, no. I, I don't see it as a net negative or a threat at all. So thanks for the question there, Eric. Other questions? Yes, sir. As long as we're talking, excuse me, as long as we're talking about tax, um, with Amazon, I believe they pay local taxes for everything that is purchased from Amazon, but their vendors don't pay sales tax back to the city. Is that correct? Josh, you want to handle that one? Yeah, and I'll. I'll I'll probably want to follow up with um, a greater explanation via email, but um, it is my understanding now that Amazon is remitting sales tax back, um, at least here in Fort Collins and I believe statewide, to the local jurisdictions. Um, as to your question about vendors, um, let me follow up on that piece. Right. Again, my understanding is that Amazon's made a commitment to collect and remit taxes, um, uh, you know, to Fort Collins and to um, the rest of the state locally, but let me let me confirm that there aren't um, any exceptions to that. Other questions? Well, if we've worked our way through all the questions, uh, we want to say thank you again for your time this evening. And uh, we do have plenty of snacks. We'd encourage you to have a few. Um, and we'll we'll be here for a few minutes. So if uh, you have a question that you didn't want to ask in the whole audience, but you'd maybe like to ask of one of us individually, please feel free to approach us. We're, we're nice people. We're happy to answer questions. And uh, most of us, maybe myself, except, no, I'm kidding. Um, and yes, we're happy to answer any questions. And like I said, we'll be here for a little while um, to be able to, to carry on conversations. So thank you again for coming out. Um, and I guess I'll just say here, 
One last point, um, this was a new format for us tonight. Um, we're trying it out. This is our second time using the format. Uh, we seem to like it, but we want to make sure that it's something that works well for you, our customers, as citizens, and so we'd appreciate your feedback on it. Uh, so grab any one of us and give us your thoughts, um, even if it's just to say we liked it, uh, because we want to make sure that we're um, delivering service in a way that makes sense for you guys. So thank you very much.